see um, the journal inscription as, as a cross-platform work. Um, so basically, it's attempting to do three, th three things at the same time. Um, so first of all, it's an exhibition space. It's a platform for artists and poets and writers um, to present new work um, in the form of final records, um, in the form of poems, um, slips into this little slip case here, um, as additional works and for Erica to have the cover. But also, um, the whole journal conforms to a particular idea, which is referencing Edgar Allan Poe's text, A Descent into the Maelstrom. And in that sense, it's an artist book. So first of all, it's a platform for artists to exhibit in. Secondly, it's a platform, um, it, it's an artist book in its own right. And thirdly, of course, it's a journal of serious criticism about the materiality of text. And we had four really strong um, sources that have kind of inspired us. And one was Adam's The Aspen Journal. So yeah, it's Aspen um, magazine here. This is uh, volume one, number one, from 1965. And Aspen magazine was edited by Phyllis Johnson. And it's a magazine in a box. Um, ran for six years. Here is the box. And inside you can find all kinds of uh, somewhat miscellaneous, somewhat coherent things. A record here with avant-garde and traditional jazz inside one and inside two, respectively. Um, booklets about technology uh, and art. There's a letter from the editor, Phyllis Johnson, um, and some interesting um, examples of, 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 of printing and um, illustration. So it takes the word magazine back to its traditional sense of a kind of storehouse or kind of box of, of miscellaneous objects. And we like that idea of uh, a kind of fluctuation between the coherent and then the dispersed and scattered. And the conceptual artists um, uh, recognised in the late 60s, early 70s, the potential for the catalogue or the exhibition catalogue or the book um, to be an exhibition space in its own right. And this was a, a famous art magazine of the time, Studio International. And this particular edition from July, August 1970, um, they invited a number of curators to select artists um, that they could present their artworks actually in this issue. And each curator was asked to nominate about eight artists which would receive about one page each to present their work. It's really important to us, this idea of the journal as a space for artists to present new work. We've uh, got a record by Sean Ashton. Um, and of course, we're thinking about the design of this magazine. We're thinking about, we've got Sean's LP vinyl at Square. So it actually makes sense to make a magazine that's also Square in format. And I think what I would say is a real breakthrough moment for me about thinking about Edgar Allan Poe's Descent into the Maelstrom and thinking about being stuck in a whirlpool and revolving round was when I realised that with a piece of A4 paper you can actually spin it um, within a square and you lose very, very little of the actual edges um, as you go around. So you're probably not going to lose any text at all um, if you spin an entire uh, rectangle A4 paper in a square format. And so as you read through the journal you'll see that the pages shift uh, and spin a few degrees for each page. Um, here's Jill's introduction, here's the first piece from this end. And as you progress, the pages spin and spin and spin until they get to the centre, where they seem to disappear um, down into the, in, into the middle. So in order to read it, you have to rotate it through... 360 degrees, is that right? Or? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, the reader is really tasked and there's something, you know, when you read something you become really interested in, it's called the trance or fascination of reading. And because our journal is about the materiality of text, I wanted a device that kind of made you actually almost wrestle with this um, journal um, and made you think about the actual materiality of the page and the form of the journal uh, as you actually engage with it. Um, so it's, it's quite a, a challenging object to engage with. Yeah. Yeah. People talk, don't they, about immersive reading, of that moment when you're reading a novel and you forget the world and you forget the form, um, as a kind of forgetting of the physical object. And we're trying to puncture that, aren't we, by having this constantly uh, demanding object. So the, 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 the pro is that um, it really reminds you of the, the materiality of what you're reading, and the con is you can't read it on the tube. 
but you can read it on the tube, but you might upset your neighbours. <laughs> Catherine Clover is an Australian artist interested in the interplay between seeing, hearing and reading. And in this piece, Writing the Birds, she takes us on a journey round her neighbourhood of suburban Melbourne, reading its um, diverse crisscrossing um, languages and its layers of meaning. So there's the, the local indigenous people and their language, there's the post-industrial um, landscape of dis disused factories that she talks about and the natural environment too and in particular she tries to transcribe the sounds of the uh, barawan or Australian magpie so it's a kind of polyphonic multi-layered uh, piece with lots of with punctuated by what looks like chunks of strange nonsense poetry or sound poetry but are actually attempts to um, put the sounds of these birds um, on the page. Uh, this is Thursday early mild dry. Ooh ah ah ooh ah er or oh ah 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 ooh ah 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 ooh ah ah e ah e ah e ah ah e ah 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 e or and so on. Probably the easiest decision, I think, when making this journal um, was the choice of the cover artist, which is the fantastic um, New York artist, Erica Bam. And uh, she's done this image, um, and we've got a dos -a dos cover, so it's um, two-sided. You can flick it over. Um, she's done a dos -a dos cover of her work, Hypnotised, from 2008, looking at 60s, 70s pulp fiction novels and looking at their edges. And if you just like, slightly prop them up and fan them open, every now and again an image would emerge. So in this case, hypnotised, um, this woman is emerging from the right-hand side. Um, but I just felt for the journal about materiality, this was such a material object. I mean, these leaves, these beautiful paper leaves, bursting out almost like three-dimensionally, um, which is, in, in, in fact, of course, the two-dimensional image. Yeah, and what's really nice about it is that there are lots of... Uh, people who photograph books but what you never really see or focus on is the, the edges of the page and you can really kind of see the, the rough edges so it's kind of, it kind of confuses the, the, um, the anatomy of the book because this should be the front and yet it's also the side and I think it's, it's doing something that we want to do in the journal generally which is taking an object like a book which is a familiar form in lots of ways and making it weird and strange and mm. alien and denaturalising it in a particular way. And I love that sense of it toggling between total surface and total depth. Mm. Promise of kind of intimacy and subjectivity and story and moving into the gutter of the book and finding out what on earth is going on here in this mysterious But we're trapped at the same time on this beautiful plane. Yeah. This is her book, The Naked Eye, and um, the first image there is Flint. We'll go to Shampoo. Uh, that's Goldie Horn, of course. Um, and Jaws. Um, a lot of these books were based on celebrity culture um, at the time. Amnesia. Beautiful, beautiful images. Art Garfunkel from Simon and Garfunkel. The curator Kathleen Chaffee notes about Erica Bond's work. All of the naked eye images look between the fanned pages of paperbacks that date back to the 1950s to the 1970s and a fashion for mass-marketed celebrity biographies and movie novelizations, featuring photo sections and pulpy paper stained by brightly dyed edges. Chaffee also cites Bam herself, who says of her process for mining suitable source material for her work. My initial attraction to these books was material, to the bright colours of their edges, the discolouring of their acidic pages, the presence of the photographs, but the truth is, that these books and these images are imbued with the popular culture I grew up with. Anthropologically speaking, they are artefacts from my youth. Damaged books, uh, broken books, tattered books. Michael Durant has written this great article for us called Old Books, New Beginnings, Recovering Lost Pages, which is about 16th and 17th century 
Bibles and religious books, and all of which have been battered or attacked or crumbled or partially destroyed in some way. So there are missing title pages, missing pages. Um, he's interested in how those early modern readers responded, but also how we might, as readers, uh, catalogers, historians, conservators, respond to these objects of missing bits. Um, and one of the many nice implications is just how battered 16th century Bibles got and how readers from that period saw that physical um, strain as a marker of the significance of the book. We might expect Bibles to be maintained in this perfect state, but the well thumbed Bible with the torn pages and the handwritten annotations was a Bible that had been used and, and thought about. So it's a great, it's a great chapter with beautiful, beautiful um, images um, about um, battered books. Serena Smith, an artist who works with lithography, our theme for this first issue is beginnings. So she's thinking about um, how they're prepared for printing. But she thinks further back than that. She's looking at the, um, how these stones are initially formed hundreds of millions of years ago in sediments at the bottom of a lake. So she's showing that they're not really blank surfaces at all, that there's all kinds of meaning that we can read into them before they're even used for printing. And my favourite example of this is when she discusses um, the first bird, um, Archaeopteryx lithographica, a kind of cross between a dinosaur and a bird, which gets its name precisely because it was discovered in these lithographic limestones in southern Germany. And she puts an interesting spin on the term lithography, which literally means stone writing. She's asking us to think about what's inscribed in and on these stones themselves. And I'm here to read from this, which is my book, a novel, Living in a Land, it's called, a memoir of sorts, written by someone with a curious literary affliction in the he can only construct sentences in the negative, so can only tell you what he's never done, no longer does, or will never do. All tense is being covered, present, past and future. James Joyce famously said that Ulysses, the book, wasn't supposed to be read. It was supposed to be listened to. Um, so if you really wanted to enjoy the musicality and the rhythm um, of his sentences, you should listen to it out loud. The book's prefaced by a, a short quote from Sartre, his book being in nothingness. Um, I know it's a poetry evening, but let's do a little bit of philosophy. Um, the quote is, it would be in vain to deny that negation appears on the original basis of a relation of man to the world. The world does not disclose its non-beings to one who has not first posited them as possibilities. I suppose what I've written here is by way of working out what he might have meant by that. So I'll read from the beginning of it and then scoot forward a little bit. I've never had to change a tyre. I've never had to change a tyre on a car or a washer on a tap. I've never had to get the soldering iron out. I've never had to get the soldering iron out and make running repairs on a circuit board or some other electrical component. I've never had to trim the wick on a candle, trim the wick on a candle, or go downstairs to locate the fuse box with a torch when the lights trip. I've never confronted a dangerous animal. I've never taken a wrong turn. I've never taken the wrong exit off the autobahn headed north towards Hanover when I'm supposed to be going east to Berlin. I've never felt despair. I've never felt misery. I've never felt terror or what others call joy. I've never been south of the equator. I've never been a fan of brown rice. I've never taken a phone call from an uncle, an uncle I hardly know just as we're about to sit down for dinner or our favourite programme. I've never stinted on the garlic, stinted on the garlic or gone too far with the nutmeg 
Too far with the nutmeg or ape shit when things haven't worked out. I've never had to shin over a fence to get my ball back. I've never had to argue with the landlord to get my deposit back. I've never had to drive out to the airport to get my luggage back. I've never been handed a broken toy, a broken toy by a child, and just had to do the best I can with it. And I think something true to be said about that with Sean's work is he's a fantastic performer, um, an extraordinary performer. And it's great to hear Sean on this um, record, two sides, 25 minutes each side, um, performing, living in a land. Ask me whether I've ever given anyone a blowjob. Ask me whether I've ever gone on a diet, fogged my mates off with cheap beer at my barbecue, visited my childhood home, cheated at cards, complained to my MP or put up scaffolding outside my house. Ask me whether I've ever put up scaffolding outside my house and taken it down again, throwing the clips onto a flatbed lorry while doing a vocal harmony of stand by me with my workmates. Ask me if I've ever been to Cream or the Ministry. I've never been to Cream. I've never been to the Ministry. Ask me if I've ever been to the House of Commons, gone up Big Ben, taken the tour. I've never been to the House of Commons. I've never gone up Big Ben. I've never taken the tour. I've never stood where the Prime Minister stands or sat in the Speaker's chair, picturing the back benches up in arms. Up in arms, up in arms. Catherine James is curator of early modern printed books and manuscripts at the Beinecke Library at Yale, the University of the States, and she has written for us an article called Skin which is a lyric essay which weaves together a number of strands. First of all, there's, there's Hamlet. Uh, secondly, there's a visit to a parchment-making company that still operates near New Haven in the States. Thirdly, there are some extracts from a 19th century periodical discussion of parchment-making as a process. And lastly, there's Catherine's reflection on her own father, um, too. And it moves beautifully between these four different strands. Craig Saper's Global Reading Supplement is probably the weirdest bit of this journal, because it isn't actually in the journal. Craig's our digital artist-in-residence for this issue, and he's given us an essay which imagines a new virtual reading platform called Foam, which kind of takes text off the page um, and instead allows readers to manipulate spherical bubbles of information, to zoom in and out, to manipulate them and rotate them virtually. So it's a kind of provocation, a way of thinking about um, reimagining the page and what it can do. And we were lucky enough to pair Craig up with Ian Truelove, a creative technologist who's brought this idea to life in augmented reality. And using the Instagram app on your phone and following a link um, on the Instagram uh, on the inscription website, uh, you can read Craig's essay as a kind of spherical rotating spiral of text. Um, and it raises some really intriguing questions, one of them being where does the page begin and end, because it kind of spirals infinitely um, upwards and disappears into a kind of hole at the top. And secondly, where exactly is it? Can it be said to exist on the screen of your smartphone, on, in the Instagram app, um, or in the link uh, on the on the website. So Inscription is a journal that's interested in the material text, but we're also interested in what happens to that materiality in the digital era. And the spiral particularly references this character, which is, of course, you'll know, Per Ubu, um, 
who is the fictional character from Alfred Jarry's play, um, Ubu Wai. He basically wears a gidoyle, or, or an oribus, or a spiral on his stomach, which represents an infinity of consumption. We got in touch um, with Michael Meshk, who is the director from the very famous um, play, or the staging, or adaption of Ubu Wa in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, in 1964. And Michael was very kind and got us in touch with Jesse Erechard from the Themison Archive. And the set design was made by the brilliant Francesca uh, Themison. Um, and it was Bieta Bergström who took these wonderful images. And we're very grateful for Michael Meshke, Jesse uh, Reichardt from the Themison Archive, and Daniel Bergström, um, Bieta's uh, grandson, um, who gave us the necessary copyright permissions um, to reproduce these amazing images. We have a great article by Rebecca Bullard called Paper Wrap Stone, Monumental Manuscript and Printed Epitaphs in 18th Century England. Of course, all of you know masses about epitaphs in 18th Century England already, so this uh, will be of interest to you naturally. And it focuses on this amazing guy, John Lene John Leneve, who compiled a huge multi-volume folio book of um, epitaphs uh, cut into stone all around England. And Rebecca's interested in the way in which these epitaphs move between stone monuments in churches and churchyards all over the country, uh, and then they move into handwritten transcriptions that antiquarians and historians like Leneve made, and then those manuscripts move into printed um, form too. So it's a really an article about how these seemingly very immobile fixed stone epitaphs in fact are moving all around across media in this interesting way between handwritten manuscript, the printed book and the cut, the cut stone. The French artist uh, Jeremy Bellican is an extraordinary artist, and um, this is uh, one of his books. Um, basically, from 2005 to 2015, over a 10 year period, um, Jeremy basically um, rubbed out the words of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. Um, he did a page a day for 10 years. And then he has republished the books, um, erased. For inscription, um, we went to Jeremy and said, please, would you rub out um, Edgar Allan Poe's text, A Descent into the Maelstrom? Um, but we wanted it done in English and French, because the French edition had been... Um, translated by Charles Baudelaire. Um, so my colleagues are going to demonstrate this two-sided post that you get as part of inscription. So here we go. So this is tucked in to the journal, along with various other goodies. So not only do you get a journal and a record and a poetry book, but you get this uh, work of art, which is your responsibility to frame when you receive it. So here we have... This is the English translation. And what I love about this, there's lots of things. Um, one of them is the idea of having a whole short story um, on a single sheet. And we're so used to the page as the unit for organising narrative and therefore for um, a story to be a, a series of, of, of pages that proceed in order. But here we have it all at once. And there's something wonderfully immediate and total about being hit with all those words. It was very, very kind of Jeremy to do this because he said to me, you know, normally I only rub out Marcel Proust's work, so I'm doing this as a special favour. John T. Hamilton has given us a really smart, uh, fascinating and unusual approach to our theme of beginnings 
through the work of Franz Kafka. John's a professor of German and comparative literature at Harvard, and he's really well versed in um, linguistics and etymology, and he uses these to, to complicate the idea of beginnings and to show that where writing is concerned, the start is never really the start. It's always just an alteration, an adaptation, and an intervention to something that already exists. And he explores how this plays out in Kafka's writing process and the way that Kafka begins to write his novel, The Trial, by altering and erasing things in his notebooks, by crossing things out, by tearing pages out and rearranging them. And we have this really wonderful image of Kafka's manuscript showing the messiness of these textual beginnings. The thing that I really love here is this uh, image of the, the hand of the archivist, this gloved hand, uh, carefully holding this manuscript. But you can see that the manuscript itself is really kind of well-thumbed. It's been through many hands, um, and it's very kind of used, torn, and worn. So this is a really material, um, physical object. Alice Wickenden is a PhD student at Queen Mary uh, in London, and she's written the article with the longest title, in this journal. It's called Things to Know Before Beginning or Why Provenance Matters in the Library. And it's an examination of Hans Sloane's uh, collection. And Alice is thinking about that as a body of texts and objects. And it's thinking about the ways in which that huge collection was catalogued and archived and understood and defined in the 18th century and how it's catalogued and understood and defined today and the way certain tricky, elusive texts slip between categories and confound the ways we might want to order them. But one thing I wanted to point out is the beautiful mise en page, the beautiful layout of Alice's article um, in inscription. Um, as you can see, as I turn these pages, we're particularly pleased with the footnotes. We're all huge fans of footnotes as a form. And because of the page spin, the footnotes get cast um, out to the edges, not just at the bottom of the text, but at the sides and the top and end up surrounding the whole in this wonderful way, and in a way that really recalls late medieval manuscripts and early printed books, which made really dense use of the margins of space for commentary and reflection. French theorist Roland Barthes wrote a whole book about preparing to write a novel, and the Roland Barthes reading group spent four years uh, painstakingly uh, reading this text. Their conversations have been recorded in this piece that they've given us um, in a kind of non-linear format of columns and lines and boxes, which looks more like a diagram or a chart than a conventional article. And it's not quite clear always which order you should read it in and how you should navigate your way around the page. Alex Franklin has written a, a great piece for inscription number one about hand printing Moby Dick, Melville's great 19th century American novel, huge work. Um, if you were going to hand print on a letterpress a novel, you probably wouldn't start with Melville, you might think, because it's so vast and unending to read, but let alone to print. But Alex Franklin has set about printing it by hand. She's in the foothills of that endless task right now. And the article is about her experience of um, printing this 19th century book in 2020 on print technology that ran from the late 15th century through to the 19th century. Um, there's a great quote Melville has in Moby Dick where he talks about New Yorkers who on weekdays are nailed to benches, clinched to desks, and who in their leisure time stand fixed in ocean reveries on the harbour-facing streets and piers. And Alex describes herself in that, in that state. The article is an account of the history of print as a technology and of uh, Moby Dick as a novel, but also her um, inky-fingered attempts to convert this into a into a printed text. It's also a project that is going to go on for decades and decades, almost ine inevitably stretching beyond Alex's, I'm sure, extremely lengthy and healthy life. Um, so it can't end up being finished, really. Um, 
but it's a great piece about producing a new version of Moby Dick and what we learn from that. Our poet in residence is the American poet and critic uh, Craig Walkin, and um, he's made a poem for us here um, which looks like a seven inch vinyl, but um, when you pull it open, um, you will find inside a small booklet, uh, a small poem he has written for us. And uh, on the outside it says, size determines an object, but scale determines art. Robert Smithson. Um, this text is actually um, the first chapter from a forthcoming book that Craig is currently writing um, called Helicology, uh, which is an old term referring to the field of studying land-based snails. Chapters in the book expand or contract natural spirals, snail shells, fern fronds, hurricanes, and whirlpools. Um, and constructed helices, the track of an open pit mine, watch springs, spools of film, etc. This poetic text reflects on Robert Smithson's spiral jetty and imagines it as a giant watch spring and the torque that would require if one was to wind it. Um, Dworkin, it's worth noting, arranged um, the uh, words and sentences um, according to the Fibonacci sequence. So it starts with one word, and then one word again, and then two words, and then three words. And it ends with a paragraph that's no shorter than 987 words. And so, of course, he has actually encoded a spiral into the very fabric of his text. It's a beautiful little thing. Um, in here you'll see an image of Spiral Jetty taken in the rear view mirror of uh, Craig's Jeep. <laughs>